On Wednesday, January 6, 2021 of this year, the United States Capitol was stormed by supporters of President Donald Trump in an attempt to disrupt the joint session of Congress, which was assembled to formalize President-elect Joe Biden's election, election victory. Now, was this insurrection? Was it rebellion? Or was it an attempt by citizens to defend the Constitution against the government run amok? Also, why have the charges against those arrested for their activities on January 6 included to date specific acts such as breaking into the Capitol, assaulting Capitol Police, destroying government property and the like? They're all serious charges, but not sedition or insurrection. Joining us for an analysis and discussion of the events of January 6, their legal implications, their possible motivations, and their possible impact on the future of democracy in the United States is former Wayne State Distinguished Professor of Law, Robert A. Sedler. At Wayne State, Professor Sedler taught courses in constitutional law and conflict of laws. Prior to coming to Wayne in 1977, he was Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky. Professor Sedler received an AB and JD degrees from the University of Pittsburgh. He's a member of Phi Beta Kappa and the Order of the Cloth. In 2005, he was elected to the Wayne State University Academy of Scholars and served as president of the academy during the 2007 and 2008 academic year. In April 2019, Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel appointed Mr. Sedler a special assistant attorney general. Let's welcome Mr. Sedler. spoken to this group before uh, once, but this is the first time since December of 2019 that I've actually been in front of people <laughs> instead of the computer <laughs> and the computer. <laughs> and finally retired from Wayne Law, but I taught my last classes last fall, two classes on Zoom which needless to say, someone else had to run for me. My high-tech skills are very, very limited. Uh, and I've given a number of talks, again, all on Zoom. So it is just a wonderful feeling to actually see people, to get their reaction. I know we're going to do some uh, virtual, but there's a great crowd here, and I'm really looking forward to it. I need to tell you, something about my speech. I usually try to keep it to about 30 minutes because any group, let alone this group, of highly intelligent, well-informed people are full of questions and comments. It may be slightly longer, but hopefully not much. It is going to have a lot of detail. I don't expect you to remember the details, but you'll see the sweep uh, of it. And especially as other, develop, other events unfold, I think you will remember it. The standard definition of insurrection is that an act, an act revolting against civil authority or established government to prevent the government from carrying out governmental activity. It's very different from a rebellion which is an effort to overthrow an established government and take control of the government. The storming of the Capitol on January 6th uh, was clearly an insurrection. It was an effort to prevent the Congress from carrying out its constitutional function to certify the winner of the presidential election. This is its function under the 12th Amendment to collect the certificates of election from the various states. Um, the Constitution has a number of provisions dealing with insurrection. Under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 6, Clause 16, Congress has the power to, quote, to provide for the call, calling forth of the militia that means the National Guard today, to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, 
and repel uh, invasions. Uh, under Article 2, Section 3, the President has the power to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, which means enforcing the law, prohibiting insurrection against the United States. Congress enacted the first Insurrection Act in 1807. It authorizes, again, the President to call the militia, that's the National Guard, I keep repeating, to call into service and use the military to suppress an insurrection. We saw some of that on January 6th. Unfortunately, it was delayed. And if you, if you recall, the military officials were very reluctant to send active duty troops to suppress the insurrection. They finally got around to, uh, to doing so. Uh, in any event, this law was amended in 1861 uh, to apply to a rebellion. In 1871, it was amended to enable the federal government to protect the newly emancipated black Americans. Uh, it's been invoked a number of times over the years, um, enforcement of court order desegregation, the Detroit riots in 1967, the Los Angeles riots in 1992, following the police beating of Rodney King. So it is a very active statute. Congress has also made uh, insurrection a federal criminal offense. Uh, whoever incites, sets on foot, assists or engages in rebellion or insurrection, uh, against the United States or gives aid and comfort. Now, the rioters could be charged under the Insurrection Act, but it's much easier to charge them with specific acts, such as breaking into the Capitol, assaulting the Capitol Police, destroying government property and the like. Now, the, the difference is that by not charging them with an insurrection, the government doesn't have to prove intent. So it doesn't have to improve, prove that when they broke into the Capitol, it was with the intention of preventing the certification. It's enough that they broke into the Capitol, assaulted Capitol officers, destroyed property and the like. So you're not going to see charges of insurrection itself. Now, there may be conspiracy charges that we can talk about later. There's a little known provision in the Constitution. It's Article Three of the 14th Amendment. It's enacted in the aftermath of the Civil War. It provides that no person shall be a senator or representative or hold any office under the United States who having taken an oath to support the Constitution shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the United States. Congress can remove this disability by two-thirds vote. Uh, in any event, think about this. But with this constitutional provision and a related statutory one would seem to be an absolute bar against holding office by any senator or representative who may have engaged in the insurrection. Interestingly enough, it was invoked in 1861 and 1862 to expel 17 Southern senators and three Southern representatives who had taken an oath to support the uh, Confederacy. Suppose it could be demonstrated that some Republican House members joined the rioters inside the Capitol, or quote, incited them, or whatever. Now under Article 1, Section 5, each House is the judge of the qualifications of its own members, can't be reviewed by the courts. So in theory, nothing has happened yet, but in theory, if it could be shown 
that some Republican members of the House joined the rioters, the Democratic majority could declare them expelled from the House. It hasn't happened, but I just want to put it in the background. Okay, let's talk about the Trump impeachment arising from the insurrection. The House adopted one article of impeachment charging incitement of insurrection. Trump supporters in the Senate argue that it's unconstitutional for an impeachment to go forward after the president leaves office. That the purpose of impeachment is to remove a president who has engaged in high crimes and misdemeanors. Now, Senator Rand Paul filed a motion to dismiss on that ground. It was rejected 55 to 45 with, with five Republican senators joining the, the Democrats. Now, while the trial proceeded, the Republicans imposing, opposing conviction could argue that there was no jurisdiction to go ahead with the impeachment trial. This way, they could vote in favor of Trump without endorsing his actions. And so they did. I mean, the final vote was 57 to 43 to convict, with seven Republican senators joining the 50 Democrats and independent senators who voted with them. That's 10 short of the constitutional requirement. Going back to the Clinton impeachment, I have said that in my opinion, the Clinton impeachment, the first Trump impeachment, and the second impeachment all were an abuse of the constitutional process for partisan political purposes. Unlike the Nixon impeachment, which at least some of you like myself may remember, there was no realistic possibility of getting two-thirds vote in the House to convict Clinton or Trump either time. Now, some may argue that it was legitimate to call a president to account for misconduct while in office. But the constitutional purpose of impeachment is to remove a president who has committed treason, bribery, or high crimes and misdemeanors. So in my opinion, since there was no realistic possibility of a conviction by the Senate, I would say as a constitutionalist, there should have been no impeachment. No second Trump impeachment, no first Trump impeachment, and no Clinton impeachment. Now some may strongly disagree with the view. Be that as it may. Let's now turn to the congressional investigation of the insurrection. The House voted to establish a bipartisan commission to investigate the insurrection modeled on the bipartisan commission that inve uh, investigated the 9-11 terrorist attack. It would consist of five Democrats appointed by the House and Senate Democratic leaders, five Republicans appointed by the Republican House and Senate Democratic leaders, Democratic chair, Republican vice chair. While it passed the House, it failed in the Senate. The Republican leaders in the Senate, you will recall, strongly opposed the commission the committee failed to get the necessary 60 votes, failing by a vote of 54 to 35. The House then voted to establish a select committee to investigate the insurrection. It would consist of 13 House members, eight of whom would be chosen by Speaker Pelosi, Pelosi and five of whom would be chosen by her in consultation with Minority Leader McCarthy. 
The Republicans in the House overwhelmingly opposed it. There were only two Republicans, Liz Cheney of Wyoming and Adam Kinsinger of Illinois, who joined uh, the Democrats. Okay, uh, McCarthy appointed five members. Pelosi rejected two of them, Jim Jordan of Ohio and Jim Banks of Indiana. They are on the very far right end of the political spectrum. McCarthy then pulled the other three members, and Pelosi appointed Kinsinger as one of her appointments. So you thus have a committee consisting of seven Democrats, two Republicans, all appointed by Pelosi. Betty Thompson of Mississippi is the chair. They had his first hearing on July 27th. They heard her testimony from four members of the Capitol Police about the insurrection. Now, without going into great detail about the testimony, one officer testified about how the rioters attempted to gouge his eyes out. Another told about being smashed in a doorway and nearly crushed amid a, quote, medieval battle with the pro-Trump mob as he heard guttural screams of pain from fellow officers. A third officer said he was beaten unconscious and, and his son repeated, he was pleading, I have kids. A fourth officer said that he was called a racial slur by people wearing Make America Great Again hats. A Capitol Police officer said all of them were saying Trump sent us. That was the hearing. Uh, Chairman Thompson said subpoenas would be issued soon and that another hearing would come within weeks. Now I want to talk about the criminal prosecutions. Now this is a matter of some detail. As of July 20, of the last figure that I saw is over a month ago, at that time, the feds had arrested nearly 550 people uh, in connection with the attack. About 20 of them have so far entered guilty pleas. It's estimated that about 800 people reached the Capitol in an effort to prevent uh, the House and Senate from certifying the presidential election. Attorney General Merrick Garland has declared that this investigation is a top priority. It's been called the largest federal criminal investigation in United States history. There are hundreds of FBI agents and prosecutors who are involved. Look at this from the standpoint of a prosecutor. The most difficult problem is how do you apply fair standards of justice to these 800 people who breached the Capitol doing different things and with different levels of culpability? And they're all part of the same mob, that's true. But some rioters did little more than walk into and walk out of the Capitol, while others smashed windows, broke into private offices, and assaulted police officers. About 150 charges, maybe more now, simply involve illegal entry into the Capitol. This is a misdemeanor offense carrying the maximum penalty of a year in jail. Now, assuming that people who are charged with simply breaking into the Capitol do not have a prior criminal record, they would be appropriate candidates for probation and community service. But is this case different? They were part of an insurrection with the mob trying to prevent Congress from performing its constitutional function. Should there at least be some jail time to demonstrate, symbolically at least, 
the wrongness of what they did. Well, the first defendant who did plead guilty to this charge is Anna Morgan Lloyd of Indiana. She was put on three years probation and required to perform 120 hours of community service and pay a $500 fine. The second one who pleaded guilty, uh, Michael Corsio, was sentenced to sign time served. He's a, he was not released on bail, so he had already spent six months in jail, and apparently that would have been the maximum sentence for the particular charge. A recent case involved a guilty plea from husband and wife. These are the Wallens from Kentucky. The federal judge who accepted the plea, and the, the crime was parading and demonstrating inside the Capitol. He said, this is trouble. It's an atrocious act. But they had been released on bail since arrest being arrested in February. The prosecutors did not ask for revocation of the bail, and the judge agreed. But he said to them, while you didn't maybe engage in any type of violence or destruction, you were part of the mob mentality that caused this to occur. Well, they're going to be sentenced later. But think about it. If you were the judge, would you put them on probation with community service? Or would you want some jail time, say 90 days or whatever? OK. So far, there has been one sentencing. Now, this is the defendant, Paul Hawkins of Florida, was one of about 50 people who made it to the Senate floor on January 6th. He pleaded guilty to one count of obstruction of an official proceeding. He admitted breaching the Capitol, going into the Capitol, with a Trump flag, a backpack filled with goggles, rope, and a pair of latex gloves. Federal Judge Randolph Moss sentenced him to eight months in prison. Uh, he did note that this man was a 38 year old crane operator. He was a first offender and he pleaded guilty without going to trial fairly early. Uh, lawyers representing the defendants will look at this case. It did not involve violence against the Capitol Police, but it certainly involved a break in with. Clear, clear intention of going further and trying to prevent the certification of the election results. I think they're going to take guidance from this and give this to their clients. This is what happened. This is eight months. This may be a precedent for other cases. Expect, expect to have some prison time, some jail time perhaps. And there are some advantages in, in pleading early. At least 170 people have been charged with assaulting Capitol Police officers, including throwing bear spray on an officer who subsequently died. 150 officers were injured during the attack. Okay. Uh, I want to go to some of these cases. One defendant, Richard Geisling, was indicted on multiple charges uh, of assaulting and interfering with officers, including by deploying a chemical spray and wielding a baseball bat. But he did not hit an officer with the baseball bat. And he has not been sentenced yet. But the judge issued a lengthy opinion deciding to keep him in jail until the case comes to trial. And he said he is posing a danger. Uh, he is a level of violence allegedly committed on the belief that the presidential election was stolen from, from Trump. And again, 
Dirk's one, he's one, so are you going to do anything wrong? There's another defendant, uh, the Pennsylvania man, Samuel Lazon. He used a chemical spray against officers outside the building. Now he's wearing tactical gear, camouflage, face paint, speaking into a uh, bullhorn. There's a video where he admits that he attacked the officers, saying they maced us, those tyrannical pieces of shit, and we made them right the fuck back, and now they're retaking the building. So here again, you have very serious charges, very strong evidence. And again, the question is, what sense will the judge apply? There were two guilty pleas uh, in August, um, a New Jersey gym owner, whose brother, by the way, is with the United States Secret Service, an interesting family uh, issue there, but he made a plea deal. He, pl he pled guilty to the assault, to obstructing an official proceeding, and he, uh, and he was caught on video stalking officers outside the Capitol as they made their way into the building. Uh, he shoved his way through the mall, shoved an officer, hit him in the face. Okay, according to his lawyer, he agreed to accept the prosecution's recommendation that he be sentenced to 41 to 51 months in prison. Uh, there's another defendant named Devlin Thompson who admitted to using a baton to insult DC police officers. And again, being part of a group that threw objects and projectiles at the officers, including flagpoles, still stealing the riot shields from the officers. So far, the prosecutors have not recommended a sentence, but his lawyer says, under the sentencing guidelines, he faced 46 to 57 months in prison. The most serious charges have been brought against about 30 members or so of three far-right groups, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, and the Proud Boys. Charges range from conspiracy to obstruction of an official proceeding. The Oath Keepers, by the way, include five military veterans and one former law enforcement officer says that seven of them were part of a military style called stack formation that dressed in paramilitary gear formed their way into the Capitol. They faced multiple criminal charges, conspiracy, <coughs> obstruction, destruction of governmental property. The second charge involves four leaders of the Proud Boys the self-described club of Western chauvinists. Three of them allegedly stormed the Capitol and celebrated the attack on social media. Again, they, they face the same uh, charges. Third group, the Proud Boys, uh, are um, involved, again, supposedly the groups collaborated with each other. Kelly Maggs, the Oath Keepers team leader, discussed this on Facebook. We've decided to work together and to shut this shit down. He told another person to wait for the sixth when we're all in DC to do an insurrection. Uh, in any event, so at least he had not been uh, charged, but last May, against the advice of his lawyers after the federal agents seized his cell phone, he spoke to them freely for about three hours and he denied that he or any other Oath Keepers had intended to disrupt Congress's certification of the electoral call. Now, I wanna pick up on that point. Uh, do you remember we said, what are the lawyers going to do? What are they going to argue in defense? From their standpoint, they would want to argue, well, there wasn't any intent to disrupt. We just wanted to have a protest. 
Well, from that standpoint, the, the government is well advised, as I said at the beginning, not to charge with insurrection, to simply focus on the acts that the defendants did, many of which uh, are um, captured on, on video. And now there's another guilty plea that I want to talk about. His name is John uh, Schaefer, he's an oath keeper. If it, I doubt if any of you are, are familiar with uh, heavy metal, now, perhaps some of you are interested that he's a guitarist for the band Ice Church. He pleaded guilty to two charges, multiple felonies, uh, breach of the Capitol while wearing a tactical vest armed with bear spray with the intent to interfere with Congress's certification of the results. He did not plead guilty to assaults. The plea agreement includes a requirement that he cooperate with the government, submitting to interviews by the investigators. Well, you can see that if the government is satisfied with its cooperation, then it will reduce for a less or reduced sense. And by pleading guilty, he secured his release from pretrial detention, giving him time now to cooperate with the prosecutors. And that two, at least two others, Oath Keepers, have pleaded guilty and have agreed to cooperate with the prosecutors. This gives you an idea of what the aftermath is like. There are going to be more and more guilty pleas. The lawyers <coughs> are trying to work out deals. The government ha will, will have its eyes set on certain individuals who they hold mainly responsible. And the way to get convictions is to build up. You start with lower level defendants and you try to get them to implicate higher defendants. One more point. What about charging Trump with inciting, inciting an insurrection? The answer is no. He simply gave a speech a provocative one, but this kind of speech is protected by the First Amendment. The First Amendment protects advocacy of unlawful conduct, unless it can be shown that there was an intent to incite imminent lawless action and that it was likely to incite or produce such action. This is a very difficult showing to make. And I would strongly doubt that the Biden Department of Justice wants to prosecute a former president. Okay, the cases will come to trial, there will be plea deals, and there will be convictions. Obviously, no pardons or commutations. Well, after it's all over, there may or may not be public interest in the insurrection. Things fade after a while. Uh, on the other hand, it's very different from using the insurrection and using voting to deny certification uh, of the election for political purposes. Expect Trump supporters to challenge in the 2022 primaries the Republicans who voted to certify the election. And so it will go. The times ahead will be very interesting. We now turn to the most interesting part of the program, which is your questions and comments. How are we going to arrange that?